going to call the meeting to order. And the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Green Mountain Care Board here in on the road in Randolph, Vermont, with Gifford. Um, I have a couple of announcements, and I thought I would uh, save those announcements to the, till the end and just start out by telling folks in the crowd and sharing with you uh, who the board is and what we do. I see quite a few familiar faces, um, and I'm quite sure you know who we are and what we do. Um, but what I thought we'd start out doing is just going down the row of board members and introducing each of you, if you just sharing your name, how long you've been on the board, and a little bit about your about background. Okay, I'll start. Hi everyone, I'm Robin Lund. I've been on the board uh, almost three years. It'll be three years this fall. Um, and my background is, uh, I'm an attorney by training. I also have a master's in healthcare delivery science from Dartmouth. And uh, I worked at the legislature for a long time and then with former Governor Shumlin as well. So that's who I am and why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Maureen Yusufer. I've been on the board just a little over two years. Um, my background is more corporate finance. I was um, CFO for seven generation. Um, for four years and then other financial positions uh, in the private sector for 25 plus years. Um, I'm Tom Pelham, uh, <clears throat> native of Arlington, Vermont. Um, been on the board for a year and a half of it now, so I, I can't claim that I'm the newbie anymore, Jets. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, no excuses. Um, and um, I, <clears throat> I was pretty involved in some stuff um, when I lived in, uh, in, in the Boston area, but I came back to Vermont in 1989 and was uh, a housing commissioner, finance commissioner for Howard Dean, tax commissioner for um, Jim Douglas, a member of the legislature, and uh, and then uh, Deputy Secretary of Administration. So my name is Kevin Mullen, I chair of the board, and I've been a member for just over two years. Maureen and I started on the same day. And uh, my background is primarily in small business. Um, I did spend 19 years in Montpelier, and four years in the House, and 15 years in the Senate. And uh, I usually start off, but since there are so few people that I, I know in the room, but I'll do it anyways. <laughs> Most of my career was spent as an exhibitionist. <laughs> so I primarily owned movie theaters. <laughs> it's hard to follow up. Uh, so my name is Jessica Holmes, and I've been on the board for uh, five years this fall. And um, while I'm not at the board, I also teach economics at Middlebury College, and I've been doing that for close to 20 years. And I teach classes in health economics, which is quite relevant to what we do. Microeconomics, public finance, did that for a while. Haven't done that in a while. Economics of sin, which is relevant yeah. to Kevin's former work. <laughs> and uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, my name is Lynn Combs. I am the Associate General Counsel for the board, and I've been here for about six months. So. And I get to be the movie. And she came from California, which is I did. really I've been, impressive. I've been in Vermont for about a year and a half. So. And I'm Susan Baird. I'm the executive director. I've uh, worked at the board for almost six years. Um, before working at the board, I was the public policy director for Bi-State Primary Care Association, um, who they represent the federally qualified health centers. Before that, um, I did health law, and before that, I worked in industry for the vac in the vaccine world. Um, so welcome, everyone, and thank you. And before I forget, I just want to give a shout out to Ashley Lincoln for helping arrange today. Um, this morning, the board and I um, separated. Uh, one thing about the Green Mountain Care Board is when, whenever we're a quorum, so any time there's three or more folks on the board together, this needs to be a public meeting. So what we did is we separated folks out two by two, and we took field trips throughout the community this morning and learned about the great work that folks in this area are doing. And we'll hear more about it in our presentation this afternoon. Um, but I did just want to set up by giving a few more um, updates on what the board does and also to set up the presentation we're going to hear this afternoon. 
So uh, the board is a five-member board. It's an independent board. So it's independent of the legislature. It's independent of the administration. So the decisions we make are very non-political, apolitical. Um, the, the board members are appointed by the governor. They go through a very rigorous process through a nominating committee. Um, that appointee also has to be uh, confirmed by the full Senate. Um, so we're we're very lucky to have this prestigious group uh, on the board, and, and it's a it's very stringent to get through. Um, I, I want to hit on the, the mission of the board because this will be related to what we hear today. So the mission of the board is the AAA, so to reduce the cost of health care while at the same time making sure that there's access to high quality health care for all Vermonters. One of the things we are focusing on and really the primary area of our, of our focus um, in the last couple of years has been an agreement with the federal government um, that uh, it's an agreement between the state of Vermont and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And this agreement is looking at uh, ways to uh, reduce the rate of healthcare costs and growth in the state, as well as looking at different ways to pay for healthcare. Um, right now, uh, and I'm gonna try not to be too wonky, right now in our system, primarily, uh, providers are paid on a, a per procedure, per visit uh, basis. This is often called fee for service. The move in this agreement that we've uh, signed with the federal government is to focus on population health as well as value-based care. And you'll hear these terms moving away from fee for service and pay for quality and value-based care. And that is essentially what we're doing in terms of um, working on population health and prevention. You're gonna hear from folks today from the Gifford community about the things that they're doing to help us, the city of Vermont and the board, reach our goals with the federal government to reduce the cost of health care as well as work on different payment methods. Um, the, there are three overarching goals with the agreement we've signed with the federal government, and they are to reduce the deaths of uh, related to suicide and drug overdose, Second, to reduce the morbidity and the mortality of chronic disease like diabetes or hypertension. And third, to increase access to primary care. And what we've asked Gifford and the accountable communities for healthcare in this area to share with us are ways they are addressing those issues in the community. So you'll see that in their presentation, they'll be addressing those areas, as well as I think a few more, because they, they do quite a bit down here. So we are really looking forward to listening and learning from all of you. Um, we will have uh, um, moments for public comment throughout the discussion, and I am really look, looking forward to learning from all of you today. So I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, unless you have anything else. Oh, I've been reminded I have to read this, this statement because um, one of the, I didn't list out our duties. I, I think many folks in this room know that we are, the board um, has overview, uh, oversight of the hospitals in their hospital budget process. Uh, we also um, decide and um, uh, review rates that are requested for the large market as well as for QHPs, qualified health plans. Um, so I, we made a decision on a large group um, filing last week and per our statute, I must read it, so bear with me as I read the uh, results of our decision. So the board has approved rates for the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and the Vermont Health Plan large group rate filings effective the third quarter of 2019. On February 21st, 2019, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and the Vermont Health Plan proposed an average annual rate increase of 49% for their large employer groups, affecting 68 large employer groups with approximately 14,600 covered lots. On May 23rd, the Green Mountain Care Board ordered Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and the Vermont Health Plan to reduce their overall rates by approximately 0.3% to address a calculation error in the generic drug unit cost trend and by 0.5% to reduce the annual medical utilization trend 
and the impact of administrative costs. The board approved the modified rate, resulting in an overall average annual rate increase of approximately 14%. And then I will also send out a plug and a reminder that um, the board will be, um, has received the um, qualified health plan um, rates for Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP. Those hearings will be held in Montpelier on July 22nd for MV MVP and July 23rd for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, the, there will be an open public comment period as well as a public forum for folks to attend. And all of this information is on our website. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Will that suffice for that? That is wonderful. Okay. Thank you. And now I can turn this back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, chair. Susan. The next item on the agenda is the minutes of Wednesday, May 15th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 15, 2019, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And at this point, we're going to turn the meeting over to the, the Gifford community. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the great hospitality. Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Dan Bennett. I'm the president and CEO at Gifford Healthcare and Gifford Medical Center, and also Gifford Retirement Community. And I want to take uh, uh, an opportunity to say thank you to the Green Mountain Care Board. We have uh, a number of different uh, venues uh, where we are presenting information to the Green Mountain Care Board to help them do their job, their regulatory function uh, here in Vermont. Uh, typically, that is around financial issues. Um, and uh, we do also meet um, on a regular basis, one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. Um, and uh, we're very happy that uh, they've taken this opportunity today to come to the Gifford community to learn what happens behind those numbers, what happens with the care we provide, what happens with uh, the work that the Gifford people do on a daily basis, uh, but also, just as importantly, the work that we do with the partners that we have in the community uh, all toward the goals, um, I think um, the same goals that the Green Mountain Care Board has to make our populations, uh, help our populations stay healthy uh, and to meet the, the aims of the all-payer model. Um, so we're very happy to have uh, the Green Mountain Care Board here today. Appreciate uh, the efforts they made um, to come out and meet with our groups. And uh, two of them even uh, went um, over uh, some mountains and uh, followed one of our excellent um, uh, staff members uh, with her driving um, and uh, made it between here and Chelsea uh, safely. So we're glad that, uh, that that worked well. So what we have uh, for you today, um, we have uh, in the room, we have our, uh, our, our senior leadership team uh, here at Gifford and uh, you're gonna hear from a couple of them. I'll ask them to introduce themselves when they come up. Um, as questions come up, um, we will call on um, whomever the subject matter expert is in that area to, to address the question and answer those questions. And I'd also ask that uh, everyone please identify yourself when you do that. Um, we are going to provide a summary of two of the three breakout groups uh, that occurred this morning, uh, give you some uh, context of what we talked about. Um, and some other information about the work that we're doing in the community and again the work that we're doing in the community with uh, those partners that we have. And then uh, the larger agenda item uh, we're going to focus on our uh, community health and uh, community outreach activities and we have some uh, special guests uh, from the community who are going to participate in that as well. Uh, we think that is going to be uh, a, um, a very uh, enjoyable uh, presentation um, uh, we do welcome questions as we go along, so please uh, do, um, please do uh, feel, feel free to ask questions as we go. And again, I want to thank uh, Green Mountain Care Board for being here. Um, uh, we also have uh, several of our board members uh, who are in attendance today and uh, one former uh, board, board member as well, so appreciate uh, the community um, participation as well. So with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Rebecca O'Berry, our Vice President of Operations to tell you about uh, the breakout group uh, that visited. <laughs> um, so I'm Rebecca O'Berry. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Gifford. I won't say healthcare or medical center because it's both. And so I'll just go with Gifford. Um, and today, Dan just went over this, and I was probably supposed to click ahead and didn't. 
Um, so this is where we spent our morning, um, and I was lucky enough to get to host a group of folks um, who are a couple of the Green Mountain Care board members and our community partners. Um, and Chelsea is our most eastern clinic. So we have clinics so, you know, around in our communities, and this is our most eastern clinic. We've been in this building since 2009, um, and it has these wonderful vaulted ceilings in the front, which is the waiting room. And um, we provide services here, and as you can tell on the back, on the bottom, we also host the Medicine Shop Pharmacy and Claire Martin Center. So the Medicine Shop Pharmacy um, was brought to the Claire Martin Center by the Claire Martin Board, and excuse me, I just messed that up. The Chelsea Hill Center by the Chelsea Hill Center Board, and they have their own entrance, which is really great because they can then have hours that work for our patients. So they have some extended hours when the clinic might be closed, they are still open. Um, and that's a great benefit. They're also trying to work on having a mail order um, for our folks that are in that area so that they can get their prescriptions sent to their homes, um, which is a terrific thing. We also have Claire Martin Center in there um, three days a week, and I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. This is the original building of the Chelsea Health Center, and as you can see, it's been there since 1953, which is pretty amazing. Um, and uh, we actually had Star Strong, who was Gifford's very first physician assistant in that practice, um, which was really cool. Um, today we have a physician, Dr. Barber, we have uh, Rebecca Savage, a PA, and then we have uh, nurses, uh, an MA, and a couple, of, uh, a couple of MAs, and an LPN, who's the office manager, and then we have our blueprint um, representative, representative there. So she's there a couple of days a week and supplies sort of those wraparound services for our patients um, and helps connect them to the other services that they might need to, um, you know, to just help better their care. Um, we're trying to promote the Chelsea Health Center because it is really kind of our mission. They're in a rural setting and we're trying to make sure that patients who need care get their care locally. Um, and if we can identify needs that we can supply to them in their own community, you know, that's better for all of us. So uh, this is the Chelsea Health Center and uh, Dr. Brewster Martin and Dr. Howell started this in 53, like I said, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Dr. Martin's wife in, in a few moments. Um, another partnership that we have is with Health Hub. So Health Hub pr provides dental services. Um, they're in 10 of our local schools within Orange County, and they also provide services through that little trailer um, at the Chelsea Health Center, but also here at Gifford Medical Center, um, out behind our OBGYN clinic. Um, it started as uh, providing school services, services to the kids at school, which is where we can sort of capture them and make sure they're getting all of their screening services. Um, and we've been really working hard with them to supply the same <coughs> services to adults and then make sure that we are you know, uh, hooking them up with another dental provider if they need restorative care or additional work. Um, and so they are all over the place. These are the schools that they go to on a regular basis. Um, but Janine, who is the hygienist, is really great at just going wherever it need be. If, you, if she's not busy at one of the schools and she's seeing that there are, there's a need somewhere else, um, she sort of modifies her schedule and uh, meets those needs. She'll, she'll make sure that folks are um, getting the services that they need, whether it's closer to their home or closer to their, where they work. Uh, she works with people on an individual basis to get them what they need, which is, which is a great benefit because we need to make sure that people's oral health is taken care of. Um, another partnership that we have that was represented, to, represented today is um, our house calls program, which is worth it, with the uh, First Branch Ambulance. Um, they provide 24-7 emergency coverage, of course, for our community. Um, they're staffed each day from 8 to 5, 7 days a week. Um, after hours, it's by volunteer. Um, they supply all sorts of regular services, but they'll also do just transport if we call them and a patient needs to get from here to there. Um, they work with us on that. They also um, provide the service that can be really important to us if we have a patient who's an inpatient but needs a service we don't have. They will take that patient to another hospital and wait for them and then bring them back to us, um, which, is, which is terrific because sometimes that can be a real problem. We don't want to just drop them off there and then you know, have to figure out how to get them back to us. So um, they <clears throat> have this house call program which um, provides these services, blood pressure monitoring, blood glucose, wellness checks, 
falls assessment and first aid, one of the other things that they do that is really a, a terrific benefit to us and the patients is they do some medication management. So if they go into a patient's home, they, okay, they can call Dr. Barber or someone else and kind of go through, I'm looking at all these pill bottles and I'm not sure how they're taking them. Can we just kind of start from A to Z and make sure that they're taking their medications the right way or identify something else that they might need? Um, they also do like um, the post-hospital checks. So if a patient's been discharged from the hospital, they'll go check on them. Um, they'll make sure that if something looks a little bit odd, that they can make that phone call and connect the patient to the care that they need. Um, they also can, they're in the patient's home, so they can make an identification of like, this patient needs some other services. Um, and they can work with either our blueprint team or another local, you know, another local clinician or uh, support services area to make sure that we get that patient what they need so that they can stay at home um, or that they get to the right care if there's a care need identified. Um, so they've been doing this for about five years. Um, they haven't had this agreement with us. This happened with us in um, September of uh, 2018, but they've been doing this for five years and they've reached about 75 individuals. Um, some of these people they see every day. They'll see them five days a week. Some people they see once. Some people they go see once a week. So it all depends on what the need is for that patient. Um, so Claire Martin. So Claire Martin was married to Dr. Martin. Um, and uh, she had a passion or she had yeah, for health care, for uh, mental health care and making sure that patients are getting the, the, the care that they need. Um, and we have them in the building three days a week. They also work with us on an individual basis. So a lot of times patients of a certain age, if they're younger folks, they need to be, they need to have that initial intake and they have to come to Randolph for that. That's a real problem for some people that live out in Chelsea in these rural areas. And so they've worked with us um, to identify that and come in whenever they need to. It, it doesn't work out all the time, but a lot of times it works out just perfectly. Or if they're in the building and we have a patient who comes in who might have an urgent need. Um, if, they're, if they're there, then they're available, they'll come out and take care of that patient in the moment or at least start the service and then get them set up with what they need. Um, they, uh, they're a great partner for us, I mean, throughout the throughout our community. They actually provide services in 10 locations, which sort of mirrors what we do. Um, and so it, it's a really good handoff. We have Washington County Mental Health for our Berlin area, but everywhere else, this is who's taking care of our outpatients, as well as providing services for us on the inpatient, uh, as a patient comes in the emergency department. Um, so that's a, this is a real big benefit for us. They have services at Chelsea include mental health, but they also do addiction medicine as well. So they'll take care of our patients there. Um, we have take back envelopes in all of our clinics, and that's one of the, uh, <coughs> one of the, we work with them as our partner to sort of steer patients to that, to if you've got medications in the house you don't need, we can help you get those out of your house. It's our Chelsea Hall Center. Any questions? No? No. Okay, so I am going to get introduced to you Monica Boyd, who is our Director of Quality and Risk Management. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, good afternoon. So I have the pleasure of sharing with you uh, some of our quality initiatives that, uh, that we have going on this year. We have a... Can you repeat your name? Sure, I'm sorry. Monica Boyd. We have an antibiotic stewardship program. Uh, with this program, we really focus on the judicious uh, prescribing of antibiotics. Um, one of the challenges we face in healthcare are drug shortages and uh, multi-drug resistant organisms. So the life-saving medications that we need um, are becoming less effective. Um, so we really focus on having uh, responsible prescribing of antibiotics for our patients. Uh, with this initiative, one of the things we've done is embedded an antibiotic timeout in our daily inpatient rounds. It, uh, at the 48 hour to 72 hour mark, it allows us to ask and answer that important question of, is this patient on the right antibiotic? Um, with that and our um, quick reference guides that we have developed for our providers who are prescribing, uh, to help them start the patient on the right antibiotic, we have reduced our antibiotic therapy days by 50% over the last 18 months. 
Another uh, quality initiative that we're working on is reducing readmissions. Our focus is on 30-day readmissions. Um, and with this effort, uh, we have a dedicated provider in our primary care clinic who will see a patient about a few days after they're discharged from the hospital. Provides a nice opportunity for them to check in, to see how they're feeling, how they've transitioned back home, to go over the medication regimen, um, find out if they have any identified, uh, any additional <coughs> services um, that may be needed or additional referrals. Sometimes when patients are discharged from the hospital, um, care management will try to uh, get services set up for them and patients and families decline those services while they're an inpatient. And after they're home for a few days, they, they may change their mind. And uh, so this is a nice opportunity to kind of revisit that, that question. We also have a large focus here at Gifford on prevention. Um, prevention of chronic illness um, and, and overall health. Um, we have several initiatives related to this effort, uh, the first of which is a colorectal cancer screening um, project. And there we're really looking at the uh, referral process from primary care to our specialty clinic, to scheduling and getting the patient in for the appointment, and then closing the loop after they've had their colonoscopy what is the follow-up plan and what were the findings of, those, uh, of that screening? We also have projects focused on diabetes and pre-diabetes. Uh, we have several uh, uh, self-management workshops that are, are spearheaded by our community health team. Um, and we also have a fantastic diabetic educator to work with folks after they have that uh, diagnosis of diabetes. Um, this is a pro these projects um, really focus on helping patients prevent um, the diagnosis of chronic illness and uh, overall uh, long-term health. We do have several challenges that we face as a community hospital. Um, when we talk about mental health, one of our challenges is recruitment and retention of mental health providers particularly for a pediatric population. Um, we have six beds in our emergency room, so as we have a mental health patient come in, um, awaiting a placement in a, in a mental health facility, that takes incredible resources um, away from, from other patients and the community in general. As a way to combat this, we uh, have a new contract with a telepsychiatry uh, company who can um, have a, a Skype consult um, and work with our providers in the emergency rooms to maybe start uh, a medication treatment plan for that individual while they're awaiting an inpatient bed. We also have our community health team and uh, others here at Gifford who are really focused on addressing the social determinants of health um, and helping to reduce the emotional stress that some of our patients are, are feeling and dealing with. And as we look toward the future, uh, we're really looking toward integrating care. Um, some examples of this are surgical services um, in its proximity to the, um, to the OR and also the proximity of primary care and behavioral health care in our clinics. We have identified some needs in terms of our facilities as they're aging, uh, as we have an aging plant. Um, one of the areas where we will need to um, renovate is our emergency room. Uh, that, uh, that layout is really um, small and the flow does not work um, and is, is struggling to meet our community's needs at this point in time. And then we also have um, some vacant space at our southern end of the building that we're looking to uh, identify as, as the best way to serve the community in that area of our building. Questions about our quality initiatives? What is the uh, research um, behind the 48 to 72 hour period on the antibiotics? Typically that is when the, the culture results are back. Um, so we can identify whether the patient is on an antibiotic that is sensitive to 
um, to the, their organism. Great. Can you talk a little bit more about the telepsych? I'm intrigued by this, but I also recognize that part of psychiatry is the human-to-human -human interaction. And through a screen and through a Skype, I'm just um, curious about your successes with it or other successes with telepsych. So this is a brand new um, uh, service that we can, can offer, and we, we have done a dry run uh, of it, but we have not actually used the service uh, for a patient. Um, we are hopeful that it will um, allow us to be able to offer some services mm -hmm. um, and get patients started on a, on a treatment plan while they're here. Josh, do you want to add anything to, to that? Sure. Come up so you can hear me. <clears throat> Josh White, I'm the Chief Medical Officer here. Um, so specifically in regards to the telepsychiatry, you're absolutely correct. That person-to-person -person interaction is critical um, to that relationship. Um, the key here in understanding the value is that um, as is true in most emergency departments, um, a lot of these patients are essentially being housed. Uh, they're in a safe place, they have a place to sleep, and they get fed, but they do not get acute treatment for whatever mental health condition uh, that they're facing um, until they reach uh, their uh, uh, designated uh, uh, receiving facility. Um, uh, so it's a problem that they're not receiving the care that they need. Having a, an available telepsychiatry consult um, addresses that, um, and we can start to address that patient's need, if not as well as with the person in the room. Um, and it also offers a, a potentially significant bonus in reducing the burden both on the local emergency department as well as the state services. Um, the hope with these uh, uh, patients is that uh, as they interact with the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist is able to provide a consult um, uh, that uh, will allow the emergency physician to uh, provide medication based on those recommendations and time passes where the patient has the opportunity to decompress from whatever acute event triggered their suicidal status or what have you, um, maybe uh, relationship issues or loss of a job, something along those lines, um, that patient may improve and be able to go home and subsequently are no longer going to require inpatient care uh, such that uh, the whole state will benefit from this as our triage list gets smaller. Um, uh, so in, uh, in addition to kicking off this uh, uh, telepsychiatry program, we're uh, tying quality initiatives to it and examining our length of stay uh, um, from uh, uh, previous uh, years uh, to as patients receive this and can we reduce that amount of time they spend in the emergency department. Thank you, that's really helpful. It's, it's also interesting, you might want to mention um, the psychiatrist because everybody on the board should be familiar with him because we've met with him at the Brattleboro Retreat mm -hmm. that is doing the yeah, work. so uh, um, we're contracted with uh, Dr. Mark McGee um, who uh, started Alpine Telehealth. Um, this was uh, uh, sort of his uh, uh, baby, so to speak, in terms of his career goals. Um, and uh, um, we initially started the conversation while he was at Brattleboro. Um, he left there to start uh, this organization, um, so the transition for us <coughs> in engaging with them was fairly easy as that road had already been paved. That's great. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, then I will turn it back over to Ashley. Okay. So I'm going to begin with a overview of our community outreach program, but later in our afternoon presentation, we're going to take a deeper dive into some of our work. I would like to focus this morning on, or this afternoon, on our discussion we had this morning, which really focuses on nutrition and exercise. Uh, we are very fortunate to work in a community that is actually growing with the desire to be healthy. Um, perhaps some of you in the room are aware of RASTA, which is a new um, program of developing both mountain biking and backcountry skiing. Um, they are also developing trails. So we are working very closely with them in a way to encourage our youth to not only participate in team sports, but also individual lifelong sports, knowing that that will hopefully create a adult 
that will be aware of exercise and healthy eating. So one of our very early on partnerships when we kicked off our community health program was with our Randolph Rec Department. And it was a, a win early on when we discovered that at their youth sport level, youth team level, they did not have first aid bags. So that was a very easy gold star for Gifford when we could very quickly pull together what they needed um, for to make sure that all the kids were healthy and safe during a team sport. We also have a very active um, staff with both our providers and staff members that want to volunteer. They want to be engaged. Uh, you're seeing many of us as volunteer um, coaches. We may be refing. Uh, you know, we are at events providing medical support. So again, having Gifford's presence really brings a sense of calm to the parents on the sideline. So with our community outreach program, this is where we started. And I think that you'll discover it's really grown over time. This summer, we're going to be partnering with the area rec um, camps, and we're going to have an eye on nutrition. Certainly during the school year, you'll hear we've got some members of our school community with us today. Um, but the kids actually are very happy during the school year because they're guaranteed two meals. They get breakfast and lunch. So while we think about kids being very excited when that um, end of the year school bell rings and they get to go home, there's actually a sense of fear with some of our children because they don't have access to food. So again, um, we are working very closely with our area food shelves to try to combat that problem. In addition, we're going to be down at the REC program teaching kids about healthy eating. Um, I'm sure many of you see kids drinking a big gulp, probably have an extra large bag of Doritos, um, not the type of food choices we'd like them to be making. So we would like to work with kids and teach them other alternatives that taste good and in the summer months are readily available. So as I mentioned with the Randolph Area Food Shelf, um, this has been a really excellent partnership for the hospital. Again, um, earlier we talked to Rebecca O'Berry, and Rebecca is actually the president of the food shelf. Um, Bethany, who you're going to hear from later, she's the volunteer coordinator. Um, we have another woman in our quality department who's the vice president of the food shelf. So I think all these 501c3s are actually pretty smart, and they know where to go to find quick and active volunteers. Uh, but we are excited to partner with the food shelf and a project that we took on this year just in, actually in the last few weeks was we created a food staple bag. Um, when we have patients come to the hospital for their primary care visits to have their um, you know diabetic check, <coughs> to have whatever sort of um, you know appointment here, there's often could be another nagging problem that is creating a larger health issue. And clearly, um, our doctors can dispense the best medical advice um, that we have available. However, there's also other social determinants that are bringing down that patient. And very quickly, we discover that access to food is often one of them. So what we have done with the Randolph Area Food Shelf is we've created a staple bag. Um, it's a, ba a Gifford green bag, so when patients walk out, there's no, um, nobody knows what's in it. Uh, but it has been filled with non-perishable items that we get at the food shelf that they can bring home and have access to that food. Uh, we actually have that as part of our inventory system. It's down in our materials management department. It goes to all of our outlying clinics. And all we have to know is when they're dispensed, and then we send another bag to replace it. So that's a program we're really excited about, and we certainly have heard um, a lot of feedback on how positive it is. We also are working with Kimball Library. Every day after school, that is a spot where we see youth going. And the librarian reached out to Bethany and shared that there were food insecurities that she was hearing. So again, we had those bags stocked down at the library for kids to be able to take when they leave. Um, just this last, in, in May, which <laughs> say a few weeks ago, um, we kicked off Veggie Van Gogh. That is a program with the Vermont Food Bank. Uh, they will continue to be here at Gifford the second Thursday of the month from 11.30 to 1. Um, it was a huge success. 
I will say that we were really pleased with the amount of people who came out to access the food, but also the amount of collaborati uh, collaborations we were able to highlight for our folks here. Um, we had a lot of local 501c3s with the table. Another area that we've been focusing on are our senior centers. During November, it's Giving Tuesday, and that's a very popular day in our country where folks ask for money uh, for 501c3s. Um, at Gifford, we decided to do it different, and we decided to look at Giving Tuesday as our day to give back. So during the month of November, we collect food in all of our outlying clinics as well here at, at Gifford, and we then deliver that to all of our local food shelves. We also serve free community lunches in all of the senior centers. <laughs> so our chefs, um, for those of you who don't know, we have an incredible team of talented chefs here at the facility. Um, they come on site with Bethany, myself, other members of our senior management team. We have doctors who come out, and we serve lunch to the seniors for free. Um, that gives them an opportunity to get to know Gifford differently. Um, it gives us a chance to give back, and it also allows us to have a finger on the pulse of what those communities need. Um, I think a lot of us have ideas that we think we know what our neighbors need, but when you're actually sitting there serving food and engaging in conversation, you very quickly realize that perhaps what you thought was the issue may not be. All of these outreach opportunities are what have guided us to develop a very strong community outreach program. So before I go further, <laughs> are there any questions on those pieces? I guess not. Okay, because I have more. <laughs> so our larger presentation for, uh, I'm gonna speak for a few minutes and then turn it over to my colleague, Bethany. Um, for many, many years, um, actually before it became a mandate by the federal government, we have been doing community needs assessments. And those outreach surveys, um, we actually have worked at our town meetings to have paper surveys. Again, we serve a lot of rural communities that don't have access to the internet. So we had to think creatively to find out how do we actually reach our population to find out what they need. And um, everybody still goes to town meeting. So we have paper surveys at town meetings. We do have online surveys. We have surveys within our clinics. And we take this opportunity to actually ask our neighbors and friends where their areas of focus are for this facility. Um, that is, again, mandated by the federal government. And it's updated every three years. This survey actually helps us also create our strategic plan. I give a lot of kudos to our volunteer board because they look at these results and they let this guide that decision-making process. And while a strategic plan is just a roadmap, it does help us stay focused on, on the prize at the end. Um, not always are we able to <coughs> check off all those items as complete. However, I think we've done a pretty good job and um, this information that we have today has really helped develop our community outreach program. No surprises here with what we've discovered with our community needs assessment. Um, our community is telling us there's a problem with drug addiction, there's a problem with um, obesity, mental health issues, and preventative health care. So clearly, it goes hand in hand with what Susan shared, the direction that the Green Mountain Care Board is looking for all hospitals to respond to. These are the areas that we have latched onto and have been able to successfully get out into our community with education events. We've done a lot. Um, two years ago, we received funding from a um, donor $25,000 per year that allowed us to reinvigorate our community outreach program. At that time, we made the commitment that that would not pay for salary. It would pay for all the projects and all of the initiatives that we wanted to pull off within the community. So we hired Bethany Silloway, who will be joining me up here shortly. Um, and we immediately said, what do we need to do? We did a lot in a short amount of time. 
But then we realized that we really needed to focus our efforts differently. So uh, we are going to take a moment and look back and talk about our outreach around drug and alcohol prevention. And then moving forward, it's really going to tie in nicely with the nutrition and the um, recreation. Are there any questions for me? OK. Bethany? <coughs> I'm Bethany Silloway. I'm the Community Relations Coordinator here at Gifford, as well as the RISE Vermont Program Manager for Orange County. That's a pretty new role, so we're not going to talk about that too much today. <laughs> um, first off, thank you so much for being here today. I get the pleasure of talking about all the really awesome, fun things that we do here at Gifford. Um, so I'm honored to get to do that with you today. I also want to thank our administration for just constantly being so supportive of our outreach efforts and understanding how important that is to the community. Um, I feel strongly that the more we educate folks and teach them about the preventative measures they can do, though I'm going to spend some money doing it, it's going to save us a lot of money in the long run. So it's just nice to hear that again. <laughs> Reminds me of my efforts and what I'm doing. <laughs> um, my goal with a lot of the outreach that we do is to keep Gifford top of mind for everybody all the time. How can Gifford help you? live a better life, live a more comfortable life, be supportive to a cause that you're trying to get going in your area. Uh, when I first took this over, I kind of didn't know where to start. Um, we had our initiatives, but I needed to form those relationships in the community and see what they needed from us. Uh, and like Ashley said, sometimes we think we know what we need to do, but then we get out there and find out it's something totally different. I'm gonna tell a story with one of our partners where that happened later on. Um, I was really inspired also after watching um, the relationships with our local LEAD program, which I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes, but we have officers that go into the school systems to teach the law enforcement against drugs. And we've done a lot of work with them, which is really wonderful. And one thing I got to see through all of that was the relationships that those kids were forming with these officers. And oftentimes, and I know for me growing up, uh, being really friendly with your local police officers wasn't really something you did. It was more like, whew, I hope they don't know my name. Um, <laughs> and watching these kids have these relationships with these local law enforcement officers was just heartwarming. Uh, they hug them. They're excited to see them. They joke around with them. And all I could think is down the road someday uh, when they're in trouble possibly or thinking about it or could be in a situation where they need them, what an awesome thing. These guys are their friends, they're comfortable with them, they can go to them, but they still respect their badge and what they are. Um, so my goal was how do I form that relationship with our community members, with the kids, with all of us here at Gifford. Uh, I want people to look at our physicians as comfortable people to talk to, uh, a you know, comforting ear, a good place to be. That way if they're here with us in kind of a bad situation, they're really ill, kind of something scary is going on, they're comfortable, they're in a place, they're familiar with the faces, and they're comfortable to talk to us about those kind of scary situations. So that's one of my goals behind what we do. Uh, so we, like Ashley mentioned, we've done a lot of outreach, but what I'm really gonna focus on today is our efforts in uh, education of prevention, drug uh, and alcohol addiction prevention with our youth and as well as the community and educating the community about why you become addicted, uh, what happens when you become addicted, what are your treatment options, is there hope for people after addiction? Uh, so that is our really big focus we had last year. So the first real uh, outreach I got to do uh, in my role was working with the LEAD program. So that's the Law Enforcement Against Drugs, and they are currently kind of all over Orange County, headed, headed up in this area by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. And they completely supported themselves. So Orange County Sheriff's Department has to raise money to be able to support this program and to be able to put these officers into the school system to work with the kids. Uh, they go in once a week for a six to eight week series uh, with the kids and at the end, the kids have homework and they have projects and they present and they do, uh, 
a graduation ceremony. So the first thing we did was bought them pizza. <laughs> um, those kids uh, earned it. They worked hard for it. We got to go to the graduation and provide food for them, which all kids love pizza. So that was our first thing we were able to do for them. And that just started a wonderful relationship with us uh, and lead. So basically, I kept saying to them, what can we do for you? What can we do for you? So the next thing we heard was, well, we don't have a middle school curriculum. Right now, the only curriculum that they had was grades K through six. So after sixth grade, the kids weren't getting anything after that. So we said, well, obviously, we're going to buy you that curriculum. Uh, we need to do that, as well as continued uh, to support that in the schools. It's hard for these school systems to carve time out of their day to host these programs. And with Gifford getting behind it and being supportive of it, that encouraged them that that was important and they needed to do that. So we're happy to use our voice with the experts that we have to keep programs like that going. What else did we do? Oh, we also supported their uh, end of the year celebration. They pulled in all the lead, graduating lead classes from the year and they had a big party down at the rec field. We provided food for them. We had a t-shirt designing contest with the kids. Um, we picked a winning t-shirt and got those printed and were able to give those to all the kids at the end of the year. That was just really fun to be a part of. Uh, we also took one of their local officers that participates in it down to Washington, D.C. with myself last year to uh, go to the big prevention conference, which I have to say I was very humbled and proud to be from Vermont. <coughs> Uh, because a lot of the things that they were presenting in these big presentations, I was like, Vermont's got this. Like, <laughs> we are leading the way. And so when I came back and had to report out on it to my prevention group, they were like, so what did you learn? I was like, that were awesome. <laughs> um, so that was really exciting um, to feel that way down there and all these really smart big groups that were meeting. And I was like, Vermont is really doing a wonderful job. So I got to leave there very proud. I have a couple folks in the room that have been a part of the LEAD program with me. Scott, can you join me up here? I know you're hiding back there. But. <laughs> uh, we have Lieutenant Scott Kluat from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. He's actually going to be taking over the uh, LEAD classes in this area this coming year. But I was just going to give him a moment to speak to the benefits of us partnering together on this. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Scott Kuala. I'm a lieutenant with the Orange County Sheriff's Office and uh, recently took over the uh, supervisory of the uh, LEAD program here in the Orange County community. Um, and Gifford has really helped us out greatly with purchasing uh, all the material for the kids uh, for the LEAD program. Uh, right currently we have, uh, we're doing uh, classes in all over the Randolph schools and even on the other side of the mountain in the Bradford and Kingston areas out there as well. And Gifford also is helping us out with that piece as well. LEAD is a, uh, it's, it used to be DARE. DARE was that preventative program way back when. And DARE kind of fell by the wayside and LEAD took its place. Um, with the, what LEAD is, is you know, it teaches a lot more than just drug awareness. It also teaches uh, you know, uh, tools for kids to use in regards to bullying, peer pressure, um, and everything that they would need growing up. It's a really outstanding program and we've got a lot, a lot of positive feedback from all the students that have taken this program. And we see a lot of people coming back through, you know, if they take it in third grade, We'll take it again in fourth grade, and all the other stuff, all the curriculum tailors to those classes, and they are more and more en energetic with learning new stuff year to year to year, which is really really cool. Um, with the hope that you know this stuff is taking place, that um, we'll see a lot of reduction in regards to um, drug addictions, uh, make better choices for our youth, and things of that nature. He's going to be around if you have questions. <laughs> I, keep him, I keep him close by. <laughs> um, another thing that lead, I didn't mention this, but they also talk about bullying, being a good friend, being a supportive friend when you're put in a difficult situation. Uh, maybe somebody's you know, encouraging you to try drugs, uh, how to be supportive and be there. So we are uh, lucky to have a lead graduate here with us today, John Lincoln from Randolph Middle School, but he graduated from the lead program in Randolph Elementary School. And I'm gonna have John come up and just share a little bit about his experience and lead with us. Um, 
So I'm John. Uh, okay. <laughs> you want to hold it? Um, I'm gonna just put it down. I don't want to reach out. It's even on. Everybody. Uh, I'm John. I went to Randolph Elementary School and during our fifth grade year we learned about a new um, uh, program that was coming into the school. It was called LEAD. I don't know if you guys know that by now. But, uh, <laughs> um, basically it was about, uh, first it was kind of sure it was like a risk taking and stuff like that. Kind of different things we could learn about that. And we didn't really know, I didn't really know at first it was gonna be about like drug prevention and use and stuff like that. But I mean, since we are at a younger level, they kind of started with stuff that people of our age would kind of deal with and then moved it on as we got older through drug use and prevention and risk taking and stuff like that. And uh, one of the things they tried to do was take what we learned about um, was like goal and setting goals for ourselves and then figuring out how taking a risk that might not be positive for those goals could affect us and the goals themselves and they'd kind of work everything together with our homework and kind of figuring out stuff like that and I mean I think that everybody that was in the program learned a lot about uh, things that we were going to encounter in middle school and high school and everything that we were taught, I think that we've definitely been exposed to. And um, now after learning about drugs and alcohol and things that kids are doing, we know not to do it and we know like kind of what they're doing by taking a risk of vaping, juuling, drinking, and I mean, that kind of thing in schools and yeah. And uh, after sixth grade, we moved into the middle school, and it was kind of it was nice to have um, the health class because we still kind of continued that curriculum into health and learned about more of that stuff, kind of an ongoing program. And I wasn't in the semester where they had a health or they had um, lead in health. But I mean, it was still a lot of stuff that we were learning. We could learn about um, what was going through, like the mind of someone when they were taking the risk to smoke or vape or drink, something like that, which all tied into what we learned beforehand. <coughs> and it was nice to be able to have the chance to um, learn about that. So then we now are better educated on what's, what's going on in the real world and not just in elementary school or middle school. So yeah, uh, that's what I have about that. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any uh, jeweling at your? Oh yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. wow. How how young are kids starting? Uh, they're seventh graders, mm -hmm. seventh grade, seventh through twelfth grade, and you'll see people go in and herds to go and try different flavors, and there's people that are like dealing out jewel pods and different. Um, uh, I don't know what it's called, like the uh, oils that are in the pods and stuff like that. You, you can walk into the bathroom sometime and you'll see people handing them out. And yeah, it's definitely a problem and if there's action being taken in our school to fix that, we just don't really know how long it's going to take right now. It's kind of a hard thing to stop, I guess. It's taking over. Yeah, nicotine addiction is a pretty hard thing to beat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Questions? Yeah, the prevention, learn to prevent it and not breaking the habits. Yeah. yeah, any more questions about the program? 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. He's our really great lead supporter. So, so after uh, getting involved with lead, uh, we felt like we were doing a really good job in the elementary school to support that prevention effort there, but we needed to try to do something in the middle and high school. Uh, so I heard a story on the news about the Vermont State Police partnering up with the HELP program, which is the Heroin Epidemic Learning Program. It was started by Jesse Brooks and Jeremy Holm of the Middlebury United Way. Jeremy Holm is actually a movie star. Um, he was in the Netflix series House of Cards, and he had a dear friend uh, die of an overdose. And he lives locally in Vermont, and he reached out to Jesse at the United Way of Addison County and said, what can we do to try to help this movement here? So uh, they formed this program. Jesse herself was the daughter of an addict, so this was near and dear to her heart as well. Uh, Jeremy, having connections in Hollywood, was able to form a program where they bring experts in this field in to talk to the kids. Each week they would bring paramedics, they would bring state troopers, they would bring in someone in recovery. Jessie herself would also speak. And then they would bring in a professional film crew to work with the kids on how to film their own PSA. <coughs> so they would film a 30 uh, second public service announcement. Was it 30 seconds or one minute? 30 seconds, I was right there. Uh, and at the end of the year, we showed all those, had a little celebration, there was a winning PSA, uh, which did uh, get pushed out nationally. So it was a great uh, program, and it would pull the kids in with the whole film aspect of it, uh, but also they walked away really learning a lot. I was fortunate enough to go sit in on many of the classes, and the kids were very engaged, uh, and the speakers were just phenomenal. The great thing with that program, uh, Gifford was able to sponsor that, and it was a cool moment when I went in to pitch this idea to Colin, who's in the back, and I'm gonna have him and Miss Larry join me in just one second, but uh, I pitched the idea to him, and he was like, so what's it gonna cost me, or what do I need to do? And I was like, nothing, we're gonna do that for you. And he's like, when do we start? <laughs> um, so he marched me right down the hall, and we talked to Miss Larry, and she's like, yeah, we'll, we can put it in my class, and it was just, awesome to see it all happen uh, and be able to support them so that has kicked off and Miss Larry has been able to continue that program on her own uh, in her classes uh, this year which is great and she's also incorporated the lead into the middle school health programs as well so she's a huge asset to us and our kids uh, as well as Colin so I'm going to invite Colin Andrzejczyk from RUHS who is the SAP Getting that right, and Deb Larry, who is the health teacher at the high school, and I'm just going to let them speak for a moment on their experience with this program. You know, Bethany's telling the truth. You know, oh, is this going to cost anything? Because <laughs> you know, these conversations have to wind up in the principal's office. And uh, as soon as she said uh, no, it's going to be supported through Gifford. I was like, well, I don't even think we need to talk to the principal. <laughs> I think we're just going to go right down to the classroom where this is going to uh, dovetail right in, merge right in with our health class where we really do focus on prevention efforts. And so it was just really easy to make this program a part of the, uh, the high school's curriculum. And, uh, and you know, and, uh, and having somebody, uh, you know, I mean, I could ask right who here has been affected by addiction or whatnot, and I think most of our hands might go up. And of course, um, Jeremy's connection was Philip Seymour Hoffman, right, mm -hmm. the great actor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, just to sort of be willing to be public about the losses people have, uh, have, have experienced. You know, my uncle was a heroin addict and, and passed away. Um, allows us to just embrace these topics so that maybe we can at some point get to a generation where um, not many hands would go up in a room. And so um, with the, the HELP program really being a creative endeavor, Right, with a curriculum already established and in place that was engaging and asked our kids to sort of um, be creative, right, and, um, and work with somebody that maybe they'd seen before or if they told their parents, their parents were, you know, in the House of Cards, um, it, it just really just, it took off, 
right? Do you agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep talking, right? It was very popular and it was interactive. So there was, I would say, immediate buy in with the kids. Yeah. Um, and they didn't have to listen to me. Mm -hmm. So that was really neat. Um, and you had a mom who was um, an everyday mom who was an addict going through recovery talk. And then you also had Jesse, who's one of the people who started this program, who grew up with an addict. So you had real life people with real life stories that these kids could relate to. Um, and then the film piece was really neat because they learned the skill, skill of filmmaking. So they literally learned how to make a 30 second commercial PSA, which is very hard to do. Um, so it was just an overall a great success, a great way to promote prevention, awareness, mm -hmm. and a great way. And, and of course, all of our children, all of us are growing up right now um, hearing about the opiate epidemic on a daily basis. And so sometimes our kids feel helpless in these circumstances, just hearing the stories, or even in the family hearing the story at the table. And this gave them an opportunity to actually feel like they were contributing, you know, offering a potential solution, or just being part of that. You know, and again, without Gifford's support in that, you know, we're going to try our best. But to bring in, you know, this equipment, right, and these heavy hitters was, was great, right? And it allowed the students to, you know, maybe feel like, hey, I might help in this situation. So it was really good. And Jessie's booked throughout the entire state. She's, she's hard to get a hold of. She's, her program is that well received and that popular. Thank you, guys. Yeah, appreciate it. So once we tackled that, we thought we should look into bullying. <laughs> uh, so, so Dr. White and myself uh, went to the local schools and said, hey, we want to create this bullying program for you. Uh, and we met with Jason Gringold, who's the director of the Randolph Area Technical Career Center. And I just call it RTCC, so I had to make sure I knew all the letters. Um, and he said, Thanks, guys. That's really great, but that's not my problem. <laughs> and we were like, oh, OK. What's your problem? Vaping. <laughs> so we said, oh, OK. So we kind of you know, pedaled backwards and thought, what can we do? And luckily, Dr. White had just attended a conference where he heard a phenomenal speaker on the dangers of e-cigarettes and vaping. And he said, we'll get right back to you. So sure enough, we did some networking and booked a whole entire day. Uh, Jason blocked out blocks of periods with the kids for a day to have uh, the New England Poison Control Center come in and do presentations on e-cigarettes and vaping. The big takeaway was these kids are lab rats. We don't know what is going to happen to them because we don't have any studies on any of this. And I felt like that was heavy hitting. Uh, the kids knew a lot more about it <laughs> than a lot of folks, which is frightening. Um, at the end of the day, she also met with the teachers to be able to help them identify it more, uh, become more comfortable, ask questions, and then we followed up with a parent night as well uh, to, again, just raise that awareness. Parents have no idea what these things look like. They're easily hidden um, and that it's going on. So I'm going to invite Jason up for just a moment to share his experience. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jason Gingold, I'm the director of the Randolph Technical Center. Um, going into this fall 2018, we were not prepared at all um, for the dueling epidemic that has hit the state and, and our students. And I see some heads nodding, I see Scott's head nodding, head nodding in the back, and Colin, who I work with every day. Um, and just today, before I got here, I had to talk to a student, and I got my jewel for the day. Um, and so, to underscore to you all that this is a statewide academic um, for our students and their families. I, I hope you hear that message. Um, it was great for Gifford and Bethany and Dr. White to come down and provide um, North Country Poison Control. And the students really took that message to heart. They didn't feel like anyone was wagging their fingers. Um, they didn't feel like they were getting lectured at. They really listened to the message of they don't know what's going into their bodies. Um, however, that doesn't solve the problem. And as you said, sir, it's an addiction. And what we're faced with at schools is discipline's not going to, um, we're not going to discipline the addiction out of students. And so as we continue moving this in partnership forward, we're hoping we can get more counseling for the students and figure out ways that we can break this addiction. Um, suspension won't cure this, um, so we really need to work with our students and we work with Colin and the health class and the law enforcement agencies to help these students and their families. Um, and then we offered the parent night. And we're hoping to do all that again. And I also brought down um, 
on a weekly basis, I email all our parents. You know, I do like a weekly parent kind of email. And my file folder of the articles and information that I send home um, through email is getting thicker and thicker. And so we'll, we'll these go home with every grade report. Our, you know, we used to just mail an envelope of a report card, and now our postage fees and our envelope size has gotten a lot bigger because we're trying to educate not only the students but the parents about what's going on here. Um, so we're in a dangerous situation. We feel more prepared for this fall, um, but we could sure use your help. So, and then I just want to give one more plug. Yeah. Um, and Bethany didn't know this, but Colin, can you come up? Can I invite Colin? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take a little, one more minute of your time. Um, earlier when Bethany was talking about the food insecurity and the bags yes. that they provide okay. um, for their patients, I'd also like to thank Gifford and Colin can help speak to this. Um, Randolph Technical Career Center, on the last Friday of every month, we give every student who wants one what we call food for thought, a bag of food to go home. Regardless whether they, they want it or not, it's, it's there. We deliver it to all the rooms, they're just green bags, uh, but Gifford was nice enough to donate some funds about seven hundred dollars a month. Yeah, it's yeah, it's about uh, six to seven dollars per bag, and and this way we didn't have we give to every student, so we don't have to identify a student in need or ask a student to self-identify. So we try to sort of just erase the stigma, and um, just say, hey, if it's on your desk when uh, the school's empty this afternoon, we'll put it in our pantry, right? But it's on every desk, so take it if you want it. So right. Just thank you for that partnership and thank donation you. as well. <laughs> Any question? Just one. Do you yes. think that uh, um, the legislative approach this year, talking about uh, uh, increasing the uh, age to buy jewels and also increasing the taxes to make them more expensive, are there other ideas from somebody whose feet are on the ground uh, every day? Well, what's interesting, when I had to call the parent this morning about the, the jewel that I have, um, you know, they were taking responsibility and, and willing to talk to their student, but they also, you know, the student's 17, so legally that student can't go and buy. But we hear they do get it a lot from older students, so definitely raising the age would be helpful. I don't think it's the, the only answer. I think the marketing push that went on um, through Facebook and social media, no one was really prepared for, for that. Um, what amazes me is you still hear the ads on the radio that talk about how it's a great cessation tool. Right. And uh, it, it just, it's very frustrating. Unfortunately, no one knows really what's going to happen yet. Yeah. And, and I think these students that, you know, as John said, they're risk takers. Um, and they're learning. Their brains aren't fully developed, and they know that risk is okay. And so they don't fully believe in the truth of what might happen to them yet. And, you know, for years we had um, <laughs> smoking prevention that really worked but it took a really long time. Yeah. And so now we're starting from square one again, and it's going to take a long time for this to catch up. Do you have any hope? I mean, in the sense that I have a, a daughter in high school, and at the beginning of this year, I, I came to a meeting, and I basically just said, oh my god, there's a public health crisis that nobody's talking about. Because my own child was you know, sharing with me what was happening in her school, in the parking lots, in the bathrooms, in the classrooms, under the desks, everywhere and, and anywhere. Um, as the year has progressed, and again, this is just anecdotal, so that's why I'm asking you, who, you know, but she seems to suggest that the information barrage that, that the schools have responded with may be starting to take effect that the students at the beginning of the year had no idea, naive, didn't think it was harmful at all. Right starting to the message might be starting to sink in I, among some groups? I, think I, mean, there's I don't know if two messages, can... right? There's the message of the information to students and families and we're more aware, and here's how we can help you, right? You know, so when, when we work with a student, it's often Colin then talking to that student, and, are you understanding this? How can we help you? The second <coughs> message is we as schools and administration or teachers, we're more aware now. Yeah. You know, for, for a while it was like, why are there six students in one stall? We're not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> now we're like, oh, I get it. Um, yeah, hand them over. Right. <laughs> so I, I think going into the next school year, we're definitely more aware. We're training our teachers and our staff there are more aware. Students who will be with again with us again are more aware. And so hopefully that will keep minimizing. But also we want students to hear the message that um, they could come to us. One of the ideas that Colin and I have for, yeah. for next year um, is uh, Amnesty Day. You know, so just turn it in, no questions asked. Sorry, Scott, we won't call you. <laughs> but hopefully, you know, the thought is if we can get them out of the students' hands 
and out of the building, so to speak, maybe that will even help. And, and to, to the extent that they are, some of them are addicted now. Yeah. Um, well, can I just respond a little bit to oh. the first piece about are the, as the year progressed, are we seeing a change in students, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's been interesting is a lot, so I've been in the schools here for 20 years, and what's interesting is um, the students have been saying at the beginning of the year um, that they're not addicted. Right, and so what? What I've noticed specifically is um, students reporting health concerns, breathing issues as the year has gone on, and as we really discuss symptoms of addiction, especially related to nicotine addiction, you see a lot of like, I got that, and now and then I'll bust open the DSM and be like, hey, I'm not here to diagnose you right now, mm -hmm. but why don't we just go through some criteria about what a diagnosable addiction might look like, and. And that's helping them, you know, sort of see, oh, this thing that I wanted to feel in control of, that I thought I was in control of, maybe actually I'm losing control of. And so it's really sad when we're dealing with like a seventh grader right, or an eighth grader. I mean, it's sad on any level. But we are seeing students sort of say, oh, I have to stop this, right? Um, I don't think we're close to, you know, on the downslope yet. Right, but we are starting to see over the course of a year plus of like we weren't ready for this, students realizing it's having more of an impact on their life than they anticipated. Because the advertisement, of course, the safer alternative. And so the notion that safer doesn't equal safe, right, is what we're really pushing. I guess that's a follow up to my, I mean, my question is a great follow up to that is in the sense that if an adult comes in with a nicotine addiction, you can put a nicotine patch on or there are some, you know, types of remedies to help them alleviate that addiction. What does one do with a seventh grader, eighth grader who is showing the signs of addiction, wants to have help, doesn't want to tell their parents, right. can't put a nicotine patch on? I mean, I, I'm just trying to figure out what are the solutions <clears throat> at that level. Parents and right, and there's obstacles around confidentiality, yep. right? Right. Both, there's, yep. there's all these things that yep. are in place for a reason, right? Because we're not sure how every family's going to react if we sort of said, "It's in your best interest to have your dad yell at you tonight," yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so we have these obstacles. Um, you know, ultimately, it's great when you can get somebody who's addicted to anything, right, to sort of be ready to divulge the struggle they're having. Right, and so a lot of the focus becomes around that is, hey, you know, you're here talking to me because, or Mr. Gingold, who does a great, you know, or Miss Larry, right, or Scott, you're talking to us because you trust this relationship and you're finding it beneficial. So we're starting there with this notion of, okay, after us, who else can we bring in to support this process, right? And so always trying to include family, but now and then, as human beings and in public institutions, we're aware that not every family might be the best support group, right. may even, in fact, be the provider with a good intention, but with really a lack of information, mm -hmm. right? So we have to look at each case individually, um, but always try to bring in family, you know. But I have come to Gifford more than once, who's very open, you know, I'm gonna go with your child to your doctor's appointment. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna sit with the child and the doctor, and the parent's gonna wait in the waiting room, and, because we're gonna talk to the doctor together, yeah. right? And so um, so we try, we try to be creative and do anything we can. Thanks for your hard work on yeah. this. This is yeah. tough. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I was just at a talk on Prevention Day, and they said that part of the problem is kids are getting hooked by vaping, but then they're increasing the cost of them, and they can't afford the upkeep costs, so they're just going back to cigarettes. So it's kind of reversing all the work we've done. So we're going to keep going at this. So we're not going to give up on our bullying program. We are going to continue uh, work with the school system to uh, create a vaping program that Gifford can bring into the school system. So that way it's more easily accessible for them. We can keep that moving forward and keep the expertise right here in our own house because we have it. Um, we just need to create it because, again, we're reacting just like they are uh, to these, these epidemics that we're seeing. Uh, we're also working with the Vermont Department of Health to bring education series into the uh, technical v RTCC program uh, for parents and community members as well. Um, one last thing I want to talk about that we did, we were uh, lucky enough to receive a CURES grant last year from the state. So we were able to fund a six week series on, we called it a dose of reality. Uh, our first series talked about how to effectively talk to your children about alcohol and substance use and signs and symptoms to watch for. 
The next one was the science of drugs, what happens to your body during addiction, as well as how Narcan works when we're using that. It was completely fascinating. Our very own uh, Jane McConnell from the pharmacy uh, presented that evening, as well as Dr. Chris Laconis. The next one was the impact on the community and prevention efforts. Then we had the path to recovery. We brought in someone uh, to speak who was in a recovery program. Uh, how can you help and how can you get involved as a community member? Uh, that series was a bit of a struggle, like we talked about this morning, getting folks in the room that needed to hear all of that. There was a woman who attended several of the sessions that at the end of the path to recovery, one came up to Dr. Laconis and said to him, thank you. And he kind of, okay, you're, you're welcome. And she said uh, her daughter had overdosed a year ago, left some kids behind, and she was crying when she told this story. And she said, thank you, because for a year I blamed myself for her death and her addiction. And now I know that was not my fault. This was her choice. So I came back and I said to Ashley, I don't care if anybody else comes. I feel like we've made a difference, and that's um, all that matters. So that's my just really great feel-good story about that. Uh, that series wouldn't have been possible without Dr. Chris Laconis and the help of Matt Whalen from the Vermont Department of Health. So I'm going to invite Matt up just for a moment to speak about our partnerships. Sure. Thanks, Bethany. Um, I, I love hearing about Gifford Hospital doing the vaping outreach in the community. Um, generation Z had the first opportunity to be the first uh, nicotine-free generation, and then they turned it into a thumb drive and made it taste like cotton candy. <laughs> and we weren't ready for that, and no one really wasn't. The Department of Health really can't be everywhere at once. Um, in my role, I'm a substance abuse prevention consultant. Uh, part of my mandate is to provide technical assistance to the grants that we have in the community and to build community capacity for prevention. Um, and so it's really tough sometimes to translate what we're seeing at the epidemiological level down to strategy in the community. And we rely on partners like the community outreach team at Gifford to get us to that point and to help us uh, have that anchor in the community and to help us translate um, what we're seeing into strategy and to help us have relationships in the community because we can't be the energy everywhere but we can provide that technical support we can help them with the data piece we can let them know what we're seeing in the youth risk behavior survey or the behavioral, behavioral risk factor surveillance uh, survey and uh, a good example is, of that is with the uh, safe disposal efforts um, we, we knew looking at our data that the number one place that people were accessing and misusing prescription medications for the first time was in the medicine cabinet of their home, friends, families, neighbors. And so we had a huge push, a huge statewide push to establish uh, safe drop boxes for, for unused meds. And we even now have uh, prescription drug mail back on folks. And Gifford has been a local champion in that, having, um, can I say overflowing? Is that a bad word to use? But uh, a highly used um, kiosk here at the hospital along, and you heard about the uh, mailback envelopes being out the satellite offices, even out the Chelsea uh, Health Center. And so that's a great example of a community partner helping us help the community and, and really leveraging the resources that we have to provide a much needed resource in the community. Um, I'll also just say that uh, being a part of the uh, six part uh, opioid series that, that took place uh, was great for me to be able to come and tell them about, tell Randolph about its own data, what's actually happening here on the ground to level the difference between the perceptions of use uh, and what people have in their mind and to, and to also highlight some other problems like alcohol that are being uh, a little bit overshadowed in the time of opioids. Um, and, it's, and it's so great to see uh, Dr. Chris Laconis and his team, um, and Ashley and, and, and Bethany, really serving as local advocates and, and anchors for prevention. Uh, and it's an invaluable partnership for, for me and my office. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So as Matt alluded to, I applied for a grant to receive a uh, take back kiosk for us to place here in the hospital and with the help of the Orange County Sheriff's Department I was able to convince everybody here that that was a good idea there was a little bit of hesitancy uh, in fear of folks coming to try to remove things from that kiosk but they assured me that's not where they were going to go 
Um, the state told me that I would probably empty the kiosk four times a year because there is a cost associated with that. It's $150 every time I package up one of those boxes and send it out. So I thought, oh, that's no problem. We'll, we'll cover that. Not a big deal. I empty that box every two weeks. Wow. wow. So much that sometimes we have to come at night because <laughs> it's so full. Um, Scott and I have our tricks of how we get it out now without it going all over the floor, <laughs> um, which is a really great problem to have. Um, I sometimes have to close it because I have to throw my whole body into it to keep it locked up. So it's, it's working. Um, and that assured me too that Gifford's a comfortable place for people to come to dispose of that because nobody's gonna question you walking through a hospital with a bag of drugs uh, <laughs> before they were having to go to police stations or pharmacies and I think people just weren't comfortable with that. So that's been a huge success as well as our mail back envelopes in for clinics. Uh, also wanna boast about our Narcan distribution site that we have at our Kingwood facility and a big piece of our work is to educate folks on why Narcan is a good thing. Uh, and I'm gonna let Dr. Lacoma speak to that. Um, that is all for me. Does anyone have any questions? Awesome. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Luconis, who's the head of our addiction medicine program here at Gifford. He's been with us for three years and he's brought a whole new level of awareness regarding addiction medicine to our organization as well as the state. So thank you, Dr. Lacan. Thank you for having me. Right. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, so gosh, there's been a lot of community interaction in all of these talks. And <clears throat> you might be wondering a little bit about how the addiction medicine program might play into that. Um, an addiction medicine program is something that's not common in a rural hospital, um, but it really becomes part of the fabric of the community and the degree of interaction support we have with our patients. So some of the basic uh, background for our program is that we have a team that works in our Berlin Clinic and our Kingwood site. Our Kingwood site's right up the hill near the McDonald's exit four. Um, and our team is composed of myself, um, a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, two nurses, and an administrative assistant. So some of the basic philosophy of our program is that every door is the right door for treatment, for addiction. Um, and that is meant reaching out to our various <laughs> satellite clinics and to primary care to make sure that they understand that we're always available to take patients in and care for them. Um, the other part of the philosophy is that addiction is a treatable disease, that we have medication and we have counseling that can help people change the trajectory in their life. Um, and what we um, base our program on is that teamwork is a, increases success, not only with our nursing and counseling staff and myself, but also by actively reaching out to the primary care providers um, and our other community partners, uh, which is another essential component. So what kind of services do we provide? Um, first off, um, me being a psychiatrist and a doctor and medically oriented, I think about medication. So medication comes first on the list, although it's not always the most important thing. But we provide medication for opioid use disorders, including buprenorphine, which comes in uh, sublingual form, suboxone, or more, more recently something we're offering is Supplicate, which is a every 28 day injection of buprenorphine uh, underneath the abdominal skin, you know, so for patients who may not be able to safely handle medication. We also offer naltrexone treatment. Naltrexone is an opioid blocker and um, that can be taken orally, or again, that can also be given in an every 28-day injection. So people who don't want to be on something, like, like a controlled substance like buprenorphine, could be on naltrexone. We also realized pretty quickly, although our program started a couple of years ago focusing on opioid use disorder, that alcohol use disorder was far more prevalent and probably causing much more subtle but serious long-term damage. So we also began offering a few different medications for alcohol use disorder, 
camp role. You don't have to worry about the name so much. Um, and now track zone can help people manage cravings and health <coughs> drinking, as well as ant abuse, which is kind of a, a dinosaur of a medicine for people who really want to stop drinking completely because it makes you violently ill if you do drink on it. And then just importantly, we've been up offering psychosocial interventions. So we have individual counseling. Um, patients can actually come see a counselor and not have to even see me. They can directly see the counselor and not have to be on a medication. Um, often patients do show up that way saying, well, I might have a problem with this or that. And then the counselor eventually convinces them that we might have medical care to offer as well. Uh, we are in the process of planning group counseling, um, which some people benefit from more. And we also have extensive uh, case management. So we have the MAP nurses. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the MAP teams, but uh, the medication-assisted treatment nurses um, act really as case managers. They're not just getting blood pressure or doing PHQ-9 screen for depression. They're helping people who are homeless. They're helping people who have food crises get things in order. Okay, so back here, I mean, the nice thing about the Gifford community is that we can also integrate um, our behavioral health services into our program. So it's extremely simple for us to call up when I have a patient, for instance, who's struggling with depression, not making it to their appointments for their opioid use disorder, and get them in to see our behavioral health department. Um, we can quickly get people in for primary care. Most of uh, the patients we see in our program actually transfer to Gifford for their primary care if they're not here already. Um, and then things that are simple but so extremely important, important like birth control. You know, I can meet with the patient for the first time and that same day I can get them to our OBGYN OB office to get their depot shot. So we have a few <coughs> strategies here at Gifford that try to get people into treatment as quickly as possible. So our goal is to medicate, particularly opioid use disorders, um, if it's appropriate for a person to be on medication within 72 hours. Um, I think the theory in the past was you sort of screen people, you have them see a counselor, you try to gather all of this data, and the patient drops out, they get bored. All of that stuff can be gathered later. Um, so our new way of looking at it is that really the important thing is to get the patient into treatment and then you can figure out whether they're at the correct level of care or whether they may need referral for additional support. Um, so part of that initiative um, that I work with the Central Vermont Medical Center on and we're trying to adapt now to Gifford is providing rapid access to medication assisted treatment in the emergency department. So what that looks like is a person comes in saying, I'm in heroin withdrawal, or they come in and they have an abscess from injecting heroin. Um, being able to actually screen them, and if an appointment is not available that day to see me or one of our community partners treating opioid use disorder, um, to provide them with Suboxone to take home for a few days to get to their appointment. We've also established our own walk in hours in our addiction clinic, and our community <coughs> partners in Central Vermont have done that on the days that we don't have walk in hours available so that we can see uh, patients who might decide that this is the day that they want treatment. Um, and that really all ties into the whole concept of you know, rapid assessment, not needing to get an entire history in your first meeting with someone. I think another unique aspect that shows the coordination within a, uh, the Gifford community is that we provide consultation for primary care doctors who may be prescribing chronic opioid prescriptions. So something might happen, you know, like, well, Mrs. Smith lost her oxycodone prescription, or somebody's not showing up for appointments like they should, uh, or we heard that there was a, a DCF report um, that there might be neglect and perhaps drug abuse going on in the home. The primary care doctor that Gifford can refer over to us and we can assess more carefully and either sort of sign off and say, you know, we don't really see a problem with this prescription. It looks like you're providing good, safe care. Or we may give the, give the patients recommendations for opioid use disorder treatment. 
So I think you already heard, we have the free Narcan overdose reversal kits. Not only is that provision of a, a service to the community, we're getting people to come into our office to get a kit. So it might be, well, I'm here to get a kit for my friend. I'm like, well, you don't have to go into any details. You can fill out the paperwork. Maybe you want to bring them a brochure about um, what our program is about. Um, and we've had a fair number of people come in for that. So the other initiatives um, that we're currently working on is we've had, over time, a number of our <coughs> primary care providers who may not have been as interested in opioid use disorder treatment um, decide that they may want to start doing that themselves in our satellite clinics. So um, I believe in our Bethel clinic, our MAP team is going to be helping a provider there start to treat a select group of individuals who would definitely benefit from being seen at one of our satellite clinics. And then finally, looking at uh, some of our other initiatives, um, I've worked in central Vermont in various settings for a while now, so I've had the opportunity to work with, initially with WICSARP, I know it's not a good acronym, <laughs> the Washington County Substance Abuse, and we used abuse back then, um, response program. Um, and that was started up at CBMC by, by Mark Deffman initially and the emergency department to really think about how do we all coordinate in central Vermont. Um, and at that point, I was working with Bart in Berlin. Um, but I've kept up my work with that organization since with Vixar, since I do practice a bit in Berlin as well. Um, and we share a lot of patients with Randolph, even though it's a difference in county lines. Um, that initiative led to the CVMC RAM initiative that I talked about, the, the rapid treatment in the emergency department and what we're trying to adopt here. And I want to point out too that we also, uh, Clara Martin, um, also provide psychiatric services in the area. They also have a small MAP program and sometimes their community is better suited to care for people who have more severe mental health problems since they're a community health center. So we're able to refer people back and forth to each other. Um, and we actually meet with them, I think it's every other month at this point. Um, we all get together, the MAP teams, Dr. Buchanan and our MAP teams, to talk about how we can better serve the folks in our area. So I think it's time to answer questions. <laughs> questions? Can I ask a question? Certainly. Um, are you seeing any decreases in addiction, the opioid crisis? Are you seeing any differences at all? It just seems like there's been so much more awareness to this. And maybe, like you said, overly aware for other addictions like alcohol abuse. But um, are you seeing any changes? I, my sense is that we're starting to see an improvement in at least people accessing treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that some of the initial data showing that there's been a decrease in overdoses is related to people accessing treatment. And we're really big in our program on saying, you know, hey, you're doing great in your treatment now. And people are still pestering you to buy <coughs> drugs or sell you drugs. I'm like, just tell them to call us and they can come see us and we'll let them know whether we can be helpful to them or not, no obligation. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, word of mouth is probably the best, the best way. I mean, you try all kinds of media strategies and things like that, and I, they don't tend to be too fruitful. <laughs> I was intrigued by, I hadn't heard about the injectable <coughs> buprenorphine, yeah. and yeah. so I'm just curious about whether or not, if it's every 30 days, um, is that increasing the success of maintenance um, of folks that are on it versus taking pills? And also, what is the impact? People worry about the black market, right, for buprenorphine pills. Right. So I'm wondering if it's injectable. And so I'm just kind of curious yeah. about the success of that as a delivery method. Yeah, I mean, there are some pluses and minuses. I mean, um, the first minus that gets focused on a lot is it's quite expensive, mm -hmm. of course, because it's a new patented novel formulation of buprenorphine. Okay. Um, the other surprising minus, maybe I should be starting with this positive spur. <laughs> the other surprising uh, minus is it, it may be harder to get people to engage in treatment. I mean, I don't like to use a prescription as a carrot, um, but in all reality, that's what it is. If I want to see you again in one week, 
I write the prescription per week and you have to come back. If I give you an injection, it's 28 days. If you don't show up for 28 days, probably by day 28, I'm going to be like, oh, but they really should still be on it. So we'll just give them the injection and tell them to please come back next week. Um, yeah, if there are concerns of diversion, mm -hmm. it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, so if um, you think that somebody may be, you know, injecting their their buprenorphine prescription, you probably don't want to give them a prescription so they can readily do that. If you think they might be selling it um, for other drugs or that, you know, perhaps family members may be stealing it from them, this is some way to make sure that only they get it. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. So, Dan, I know that you said there were a, a number of your board members in the room. Would you have them stand and just introduce themselves? Because we want to thank sure. them. Yeah, I'm just going to turn so I can see them. <laughs> um, so, three right here um, Matt Considine, uh, he's our uh, board vice chair. Uh, Peter Nallen, one of our board members. Lincoln Clark is our uh, board chair. We have Peter Reed um, over here, a board member as well. And um, uh, Clay Westbrook's in the back. Hey, Clay. Uh, you can see you come in. Uh, one of our board members. Um, uh, Paul Kendall is uh, a former board member as well and uh, been active with Gifford on behalf of Gifford uh, in uh, healthcare reform activities as well. So, uh, a very, um, it's a volunteer board, uh, very engaged. Um, and um, uh, very instrumental in, in all of this and supportive in these efforts that, um, that we're engaged in. And uh, I'm um, uh, in, in just hearing today, uh, sitting in the crowd, getting a chance to sit in the crowd and hear of all the good work and great job uh, by everybody who uh, presented. And thank you to all the partners who are here today. It's really a tremendous effort. But if you were to go to a hospital 10, 15 years ago and said, okay, Tell us what you're really focused on. Um, uh, we're still focused on inpatient care. We're still focused on surgical care. We're still focused on providing all of those needs in the community. But to see that change and that turn, uh, to now be looking at prevention, to be looking at those efforts where we're reaching out to partners to say, all right, what are the problems we're seeing in the community and how together are we going to attack them. Uh, that uh, feels really good, um, and I think uh, it really shows that we're focused on the correct things. Um, I applaud you for being partners in that. Sometimes you have to nudge a little bit, um, and uh, I feel like we're being nudged in the right direction. Uh, but I also uh, hope that you see uh, the leadership that there is in this community, uh, whether it's people who are getting a paycheck from Gifford, people we're partnering with, volunteers, people in the community, so a lot of great efforts going into this. And um, uh, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to hear about this, because we think it's incredibly important. I know you think it's important. Um, and uh, hopefully now you have uh, more information on what's going on on the ground here and uh, what, what we're focused on. So uh, thank you again. Well, thank you. And I just want to say to the board members that uh, um, it's great. Whenever I have my uh, monthly conversation with Dan, he always talks about he has a great board that's actively focused on what's happening, and, and uh, that's such an important role that you're playing for your community. And I know on behalf of all the board, we want to thank all of you for what you're doing. And uh, it's a, a very serious role that, that you have for your community. And, you know, the enthusiasm that we see this afternoon in this room um, you know, I just say some of the smiles are so infectious. And uh, how could you say no to uh, not wanting to do the prevention and wellness? And uh, one of the things that uh, we did a couple months ago, Robin Lunge put together a panel on the health of rural hospitals. And 102 hospitals across the country have closed in the last 10 years. And we don't want to see any hospitals from Vermont in that category. And seeing the commitment here this afternoon, I know that this hospital is going to be around and thriving for a while. And um, just thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Susan? I don't know if there's any old business or new business. Is there any old business to come before the board?
Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? Um, you know okay. what, We've, we should probably do public comment. Oh, do yes. We we <laughs> I was kind of assuming that people would, sort would of raise their hand and ask a yeah, question for public comment. But, but is there any public comment? Well, easy enough then. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a motion to adjourn? So Second. moved. Second. Been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, everyone.